Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'd like to showcase and do full test measurements on the Yamaha 6881B compression driver. And so here you can see I've disassembled the compression driver and what I'm going to do is mount it to my one inch ES600 biradial horn for testing. Now, normally this compression driver uses a 1.4 inch throat. However, my customer who sent me this compression driver uh, informed me that if you actually disassemble the driver, it reveals a one inch throw inside once you remove the front conical uh, adapter that's integrated into the driver. So technically this isn't the proper way to use the driver. However, I've uh, disassembled it and mounted just the core motor structure in this driver. And so you'll see um, the front conical adapter shown here. This is the rear cover, which I've also removed, and it just exposes the ferrite magnet and then the top and bottom plate with the integrated phase plug there that comes right up to the face. Okay, so let's go back, and I just wanted to show you as well on this, the diaphragm has unique 15-spoke design. That's uh, These spokes are, are made from a beryllium copper. So I did a bit of reading on beryllium copper. It uses 2.5% uh, beryllium and it's a similar mechanical property as uh, spring steel so it's actually quite hard it's not nearly as soft as copper however it does share the same thermal properties as copper so it has um, the thermal or heat transfer rate five times that of uh, regular tool steel and so um, obviously the heat extraction is going to be better using this copper beryllium versus um, maybe spring steel so that might be why they went with this material so it's not toxic uh, just because it's such a low percentage of beryllium. Uh, from what I hear, replacement diaphragms are uh, very difficult to acquire on these. So I was extra careful when dealing with this diaphragm. You can see here the phase plug. You can see right through. This is what the diaphragm removed. It uses a three slit uh, phase plug. I may be wrong on that. It might be four. Here I've mounted it to the ES600 by radial and I've just used wood screws going into the back of the horn. This is one of my uh, initial prototype horns that I have in my inventory. I've left the rear chamber removed and so the driver is radiating free air on the, on the back side. And I've just shown the front of the horn just to show you what the horn looks like on the front. Uh, for my testing, I mounted it on top of this, uh, this base cabinet and I didn't use the base cabinet for any of the testing results. It's simply uh, to uh, capture any of the effects from the base cabinet below, if there is any. Okay, uh, something I want to discuss when I put the diaphragm back in place, I decided, you can see the tip of my UMM6 microphone there. When I tightened down the screws, I ran a real-time sp spectrum analyzer with distortion to verify that the uh, there was no voice coil rub. And so the, I, I simply uh, s sent a 400 hertz sine wave tone into the voice coil as I was tightening down the screws. And when I, when I did this, um, the, per the percent distortion was at around uh, 6% which completely unacceptable and so I removed all the screws I, I rotated the diaphragm one set of screws and then retightened and the distortion reduced to four percent so I repeated that where I rotated another set of screws and it dropped it down to two percent and so I thought there there was something going on here and so I removed all the screws again and one by one I retightened the screws and as I went along I found that the two screws where my fingers are pointing there um, that's where when I just snugged those screws down it started to produce a rubbing and with those two screws removed it dropped the percentage down to 0.5% distortion and so you could uh, really hear that the 400 hertz tone was much more pure uh, so I, I knew that I was on the right track so for my testing I actually left those two screws removed and so it might need further work there just to identify what was going on with that there's always a risk when you're removing uh, diaphragms from old compression drivers that you might not be able to get it back on uh, successfully so 
just a word of caution there uh, in case you suspect that your compression driver has voice coil rub and um, it could go unnoticed. It presented itself as simply an increase in, in distortion, um, a little bit of a, a harshness or a hash sound. Uh, it wasn't like you could clearly audibly hear voice coil rub in the sense that you would with like a low frequency driver. Here's the back side of the compression driver, uh, just in its assembled form. So it's a pretty nice driver. Okay, let's move on to the measurement side. So here you can see my frequency response. It has a uh, good extension right down to the cutoff of the horn, the FC of the horn, which is 600 Hertz. And so extension goes up to around 11 kilohertz and where it quickly falls off. Let's look at the burst decay. So the burst decay is actually quite clean on this. So you can see that there's uh, a very broad Q uh, resonance low down at around uh, 11 kilohertz, but whether that's audible is it would be up for debate. So this is shown with the vertical scale at 25 dB. And so you can see here, if I increase the vertical scale to 35 dB, you can see that there's a little bit uh, that's revealed. Now that might be the compression driver, it might be something else, but overall uh, a very clean result. For harmonic distortion, you can see here that there's nothing of concern. It has a uh, very clean distortion right down to the cutoff. Um, just reviewing the specifications, sorry I should have done this at the beginning of the video, but you can see that the diaphragm diameter is uh, 66 millimeters, which is two and a half inches. Uh, the magnetic flux is 17.5 um, Tesla, where you can s normally, uh, more modern compression drivers using neodymium magnets, they're, they can achieve over two Tesla. And so a little bit of a, um, a weakness there with this driver, considering that it's using just ceramic magnets. Um, power handling is actually quite low at 20 watts and it's it's saying that the low frequency uh, is 300 Hertz as far as they call it the regeneration frequency but the usable bandwidth they're saying is should be 500 Hertz and up so actually there's a cutaway of the the compression driver itself you can see this this is the conical adapter that I've removed and then the back plate, the back cover I've also removed as well. And so I'm only using the innards, <laughs> if you'd call it that, the, uh, the inside of the compression driver. So you have one, two, three, actually it's a four, four slit phase plug. And I thought this was interesting too because uh, the veins themselves, uh, the, the center two veins are actually straight and then the side ones are the ones that curve in. And so I see, um, some of the newer compression drivers, even the, the T, TAD, TD2002 has straight veins. So it's interesting to see that this is uh, a feature on an older compression driver as well. So I always go back and discover that, that technologies ha have been around much longer than, than I would have thought. So it just speaks to the fact that there isn't really anything new coming out in audio. It's few and far between as far as innovation. Uh, step response looks very clean on this. Uh, the initial rise and decay is extremely fast, and then we're seeing that it's free from anything. Uh, the de sorry, the decay is quite clean on this driver. Um, I'll show you the off-axis polar map. So this is uh, from my previous publications. This is just for reference and convenience to understand what the off-axis polar map looks like for the ES600 using the one-inch throat, and so. I guess the reason I show this is uh, to highlight that this can be used in a, in a two-way speaker uh, providing wide even coverage in the off axis and it's also um, wide coverage in the upper treble so we're getting a 45 or sorry a 90 degree listening window uh, at around 12 kilohertz which would be similar to uh, say a one inch dome tweeter. Uh, so let's look at intermodulation distortion. So we can see here, I decided to do a multi-tone within Arda, and this is using the female vocal range. And you can see that the looking at around eight kilohertz, we're a full 70 dB down from the, the, the test signal 
which represents about 0.03% intermodulation distortion, which is an excellent result. It's actually the lowest that I've measured, but admittedly, um, I've only tested a few drivers uh, using this method so far. So um, this is a great way you can see the the noise artifacts between the side or between the the, the test tones you can see them across here um, just for reference as well here's the noise in my room without the test signal so this is simply ambient noise in my room so you can see that I'm I'm in the upper treble uh, below that 100 dB point um, impedance curve this is interesting. So the fundamental mechanical resonance on this driver is pegged at 300 hertz, which is really low. Um, I think that's uh, partly due, well, probably a major factor in that is, is the fact that we have this unique spoke design on the surround, providing a very uh, mechanically pliable uh, diaphragm. And also worth noting on this as well is that the impedance curve is uh, relatively free of any impedance spikes so anytime that you're going to see spikes there in the impedance curve there's going to be a resonance and so we don't see any um, sig anything significant which also results in a flat phase response as well we can see um, the, the first breakup mode in the high frequency is at around 13 kilohertz um, but we don't see a large peak in the frequency response as a result which is good um, I think that's this mechanical breakup results in a steep drop uh, that's why we're seeing it such such a steep drop in the upper treble which is fine by me I'd rather uh, not hear a high Q peak in the upper treble um, I'd rather it be a dip so that's that's good uh, so there you have it um, it's an excellent compression driver uh, it's on par with the TAD TD2001 in terms of its smooth frequency response. Now I believe I have the TD here just for comparison. Yeah, it's right here. So you can see this is the 2001. And so the 2001 has better extension in the treble. However, you can see that it doesn't perform as well uh, into the lower mid range where the this Yamaha is able to uh, hit the 600 Hertz cutoff quite easily and that might be due to the fact in the in the unique surround so at the time of this video these compression drivers are available on the used market for 650 US dollars a pair so I would say yeah grab them up while you can they're an excellent uh, affordable alternative to the TAD that's my that's it for today everyone take care and have a great day